Good morning, everyone. Uh, we would like to thank the scientific committee from EXARC and Nicolaus University for organizing the Experimental Archaeology Conference. It is a pleasure to be here today and to present you and discuss with you some of our most recent research. Today, we would like to present why and how we think that different but interrelated generations of experiments can contribute not only to reconstructing past technologies, but also to assessing major human decision-making processes that have been crucial in the evolution of our behavior over time. To discuss this, our talk today is organized into four main topics. First, we will briefly contextualize our research highlighting the importance and relevance of experimental archaeology, combined with the study of how tools were used to reconstruct and identify past human technologies. Second, we would like to describe and discuss in detail the different generations of experiments and how they relate to each other. Third, although all generations of experiments will explain in this talk, here we'll focus on second generations, which will be illustrated by key recent case studies investigated in our laboratory. Finally, we would like to wrap up and stress out some of our results and our perspectives for the near future in the discipline. Archaeology is primarily aimed to reconstruct past human behaviors and to infer on how and why they change over time. Technology also vary, involving process of innovations, inventions and eventually loss, which are associated with major shifts in individuals and societies. To untangle human evolutionary processes and how they, they, how they shift over time, archaeologists must be able to fully identify, reconstruct and understand past technologies. Although we now know how technologies change and this can be pinpointed in time and space, we still do not understand why this change ever occurred. Thus, we do not fully know which human's behavior they relate to. Although the demands of, for such changes can vary, archaeological artifacts are ultimately produced to be used. Experimental replications and traceology, the study of traces of use on artifacts, are key disciplines in reconstructing the use of past technologies. These disciplines focus on three main interrelated aspects, the archaeological record, imaging methods and techniques to identify and characterize different types of traces of use, and experimental studies that aim to replicate the use of tools and reproduce diagnostic traces. Based on these experiments, traces of use are known to correlate with different contact materials and motions. This provides a crucial reference collection against which artifacts are compared. More recently, since the traceology relies on experiments, several researchers in the field have also pointed out the need to improve the way replications are done, so that results cannot, can be not only validated and reproducible, but also comparable between several studies. So here in 2020, we published a paper that aimed to discuss the relevance of several aspects of experimental replications when applied to the study of how artifacts were used. Firstly, we discussed the significance of replicability and reproducibility in sequential experiments. Secondly, the importance of the control of variables and automation. automation. And finally, the need to use and integrate different generation of experiments in our investigations. From our perspective, Experimental replications can be organized into three generations. I do not have time to go into much detail here, but this simplified version of our original illustration shows that these generations are distinct from each other based on three main aspects, objectives, degree of control and standardization, and outcome. So to be more precise, first generations is basically or are basically actualistic experimental replications they aim to identify the factors or variables affecting the replicated task they also aim to generate hypotheses based on the outcome and initial observations in these experiments samples tend not to be standardized but are comparable between them and similar to archaeological artifacts on the other hand second generation of experiments use standard or controlled samples as they aim to assess the effect causation by testing the mechanical properties of the materials used in the previously identified variables. 
Here, using highly controlled experiments, the outcome is the recognition of patterns. In other words, the same set recognizing how the mechanical and design properties of artifacts correlate with the variability seen in, their, in archaeological assemblages. To assess the effect causation of variables individually, second generations of experiments are mainly conducted using robotic and mechanical setups. It is important to note that second generations do not aim to replicate human behaviors per se, but instead to test the properties of the resources by, used by humans. Finally, third generations of experiments aim to bring the generated data and patterns back to the archaeological context. Therefore, the goal of these studies is to test the human variability found in the archaeological record by combining star standard and archaeological-like samples. In this case, the experiments tend to be performed by humans. Additionally, the different generations of experiments are also complementary, as you can see here in this illustration, where different case studies are shown. Although we can discuss several examples from all generations of experiments, in our talk, or in our talk we will focus on second, second generations. If you want to know more, and see how second and third generation of experiments are interrelated, please see the talk by Shunke et al. in the same session. The reason why here we focus on second generation of experiments is related to the fact that these imply the design of highly controlled laboratory experiments. As mentioned before, while aiming at identifying sole predictors and testing the mechanical process of the resources used by humans in the past, these experiments are mainly performed using robots or mechanical devices. Here you can see some examples of some of the devices we have used in our lab. So additionally to the contribution in reproducibility, we would argue that second-generation experiments are crucial for evaluating human decision-making processes. While testing the properties of the resources used by humans in the past, it allows the assessment of not only how tools were used, but also on the decisions made when producing and designing such technologies. To illustrate our ideas clearly, we briefly present you two main uh, case studies. The first focuses on the study of late middle politic asymmetric Beckett stone tools, also called Kalmesser. These tools are present at different archaeological sites in Central Europe and are interpreted as highly standardized tools. Its design is believed to be related to its multifunctional character, and, and these are interpreted as a tool for long-term use. One of the most interesting aspects of its design is the active edge, as opposed to the back of the tool, which appears to have been intentionally produced and modified to obtain a given edge angle. Its multifunctionality has also been confirmed by traceological analysis, from which different types of user traces have been found along the active edges of these tools. Nevertheless, despite these interpretations, several questions remain to be answered. Is the design and raw material choice related to the technological efficiency and the durability, or are these related to social and cultural constraints? The project aimed to address these questions and infer the decision-making process of late Neanderthals related to the selection of raw material to design and its function. To address these questions, we designed an experiment to test two of the raw materials represented in these assemblages, flint and silicified schist, and two predefined and standard edge angles of 40 and 60 degrees, based on the 3D measurements of archaeological artifacts. The sequential experiment, a bidirectional movement that simulates a cutting task, was conducted using a similar velocity, acceleration, force, and cutting length. Here, you can see a descriptive di diagram of the experimental organization and design. In this slide, we present a video of one of the uh, samples that were, that were used during the experiment. As mentioned above, in second-generation experiments, standard samples are used to minimize and control as many variables as possible. In this case, we use standard machine cut samples as well as a standard contact material that in this case is a synthetic bone plate. The results show that raw materials perform differently and different edge angles have different efficiencies. 
While schist performs better than flint, acute edge angles were more efficient. Another interesting aspect is the edge damage present in both raw materials. On the flint samples, the edge easily gets dull, losing its efficiency over time. While on the schist samples, we see a, progress, a process of self-resharpening, which results in a continuous efficiency of the samples over during the experiment. These observations are very interesting and shed some light on why Neanderthals were likely keen on tools that were not only efficient, but also lasted longer. The second case study is an investigation of the middle part extant tool percussive technology from the Levant. Despite of being re the, the report of uh, tools associated with the percussive technology in this region, very little is known, is known about these technologies when compared to the flexed stone tools. This project focuses on examining and the variability observed among percussive tools within and between the different sites. Initial observations and analysis showed that among these assemblages, different raw materials as well as various typologies have been recognized. This variability has been interpreted as task-related, representing the different functions associated with these tools. When compared with the other remains in the archaeological record, these tools have been associated with two main functions, napping, hammer stones, and bone breaking. However, despite these assumptions, little is known about the traces of use or about the selection process and configuration of these tools. From our traceological analysis, we found different types of use or traces. In some cases, various types are found on the same tool, indicating that tools might have been used for different tasks or to process different materials. However, to further explore this, uh, these questions and assess the functionality of these tools, a highly controlled control mechanical experiment was designed. Based on the data collected from the artifacts, similar raw materials were used to conduct percussive, bone, and flint napping and grinding experiments using one of our, of our rotary experimental setups. On the right, you can see a diagram illustrating the organization and design of the sequential experiment. Similar to case study 1, several variables were, con were controlled and measured. These include, for example, the applied force and the number of cycles. Here is the publication of the study and a sample video of the percussive experiments on bone. These results are very interesting. The motions and contact materials are associated with different types of traces and are also present at different scales of analysis. This clearly shows that in this case, experimental traces of use are diagnostic and can be directly linked to those found on the artifacts. Another interesting aspect is that the design of the tool correlates with its efficiency in performing a given task. On the right side, a photo shows a shopper-like tool associated with bone breaking. So, in summary, while targeting specific questions driven from the archaeological record, our experiments have shown that critical aspects related to the variability between and within assemblages can be addressed. While not directly focused on reproducing or replicating human actions, second-generation experiments are fundamental to test uniformitarian processes, which defines the cultural material, that is, a direct evidence of human behavior recovered from archaeological sites. Other researchers have also successfully applied such an experimental approach, from which the control of variables has been fundamental to identify sole predictors of how diagnostic traces of use are formed on artifacts and how artifacts were used and reused in the past. However, while emphasizing the importance of second, second generations of experiments in our talk, we would like to stress out that all generations are crucial to a full reconstruction of the past. As mentioned before, its complementarity is key in our, on our investigations, as it is de determined by the questions and objectives of our research. To conclude, we would also like to highlight that in the direction of a well-defined experimental organization in design, our community should also work on setting up some best practices in the field of experimental archaeology, including common workflows, so that data and results can be fully compared. 
Although such practices are common in other disciplines, as shown here on the right, they are still lacking in our field. So thank you for your attention and please let us know if you have any questions or, or comments.